The cabin space of the Golf R is probably the most controversial bit of this entire vehicle, and that's entirely due to the infotainment system. But before we talk about that, I think it's important we give you an actual overview of this cabin. And this is coming from someone who's owned both a Mark 6 GTI and a Mark 7.5. The interior of this car is essentially a carryover from a well-optioned GTI or Golf if you live outside of the United States, which is a good thing. The ergonomics of this cabin, for the most part, are quite good. The seats found on the Golf R are leather, they are heated and cooled, and they have a memory position. They are excellent, they have good bolstering, and they don't break down on long journeys. It also allows you to sit nice and low, which means you can utilize the available glass in this car quite well. There is great visibility in this hatchback. The input points of this car are quite good. The pedal box if you have a manual, it's easy to heel tell. The cable operated shifter as well has clearly defined gates, and the steering wheel feels great. The rear seats are very usable. If you are a smaller adult, you can fit behind a six foot driver quite easily, and the hatch space is quite good. And when you fold the rear seats down, you could use this as a small CUV or SUV replacement, no problem. When it comes to the interior storage, specifically for the front occupants, the door cards are enormous. You can fit a full-size Yeti bottle in no problem. Your armrest is quite large, and your glove box is very, very usable. And the cabin space itself has reduced NVH pretty well. This is a quieter car than the 7.5 I owned, which means that it can utilize the available Harman Kardon audio system a little bit better. The audio system is not excellent by any means, but to me at least, it's a nice upgrade. The last thing I want to talk about when it comes to the interior design of this car is they've done their best to minimize piano black plastic, which for me is an enormous perk. The fact that you no longer have piano black all over the center console is something to celebrate. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that's the infotainment system. And to VW's credit, they sat down with me and explained their philosophy behind this infotainment screen that lacks either physical controls or haptic feedback. They mirrored this design after a iOS or Android tablet. They wanted you to be able to customize the screens and personalize your widgets for you, your personal preferences. They wanted you to interact with the screen either via the physical controls on the steering wheel or voice commands to change things like the climate control. So you can tell this car if you're cold or hot, I'm and cold. it will change the HVAC system accordingly. However, okay. in actual use case, this is a very cumbersome system. And the slider on the bottom is not lit up at night. So you can't see it when it's dark out, which again is a huge design misstep. If it's bumpy out, you can't tell if you've actually hit anything. You end up misclicking things all the time. It's a very frustrating system to use. And things like the traction control are buried in the infotainment system. But to the credit, the display quality itself is quite high. The OTAs are doing a good job speeding up the system. This is a much faster infotainment system to use than what was on the ID4 that I drove earlier this year and the Mark 8 GTI. Lastly, the gauge cluster itself is quite good. It's customizable and the display quality is very, very good. I think this interior is kind of a misstep. If you compare what they've done in this car to what Honda and Mazda has done in their Mazda 3 and Honda Civic, they have done a better job in those cars, modernizing the cabin while maintaining physical controls. Those cabins look just as upscale as this car, but you are not annoyed by interacting with the infotainment system, which sadly in this car, you have to for nearly everything. But with all that said, I think it's time for us to head into the shop and put this thing up on the lift. Under another VW car, this one is made in Germany, however. Can you believe it? I can, and I got my lederhosen ready, Mark. Yeah, this is coming from the guy who doesn't like German food or German customs. I, I don't like their food, but I do love their cars. I am not a Japanese car man like you, though, Mark. Yes, I take my Japanese cars seriously, which is why I wear a kimono to bed, and I've trained under Steven Seagal in martial arts. I am now six Dan. <laughs> Perfect. And when I put on another 300 pounds and put shoe polish in my hair, I will achieve greatness. Hey, why don't you guys speak English? So, this is the Mark 8 Golf R. If you look at the exterior body panels, they are all new. And they are still all steel. Wow. I know, it's impressive. The main thing, though, is they focused on revising the aerodynamics of this car. So they have dramatically increased the downforce front and rear, and they largely achieved that in the rear by the giant rear wing. But more importantly, they managed to do this without substantially increasing drag. So the real story though, Mark, is the chassis and drivetrain components. So just like in the Mark 8 GTI, you get a aluminum front subframe. But yes, having an aluminum at the lowest part of the car does pay dividends, along with the aluminum knuckles, which technically is unsprung mass. Yes, and it also increases rigidity of the front subframe. 
The dampers front and rear have been retuned. They are the adaptive dampers that VW calls DCC, and the front and rear spring rates have been increased by about 10%. Obviously, the bushings and some of the control arms have been revised as well. The rear subframe, though, is still steel. The EPS, or the steering in this car, has been revised. It is a variable ratio steering rack, and it, they claim it's more direct. And all of these suspension systems are going through a central brain. Mm, it is. This is a common practice now in modern cars. They're using microprocessor control to tie all these electromechanical systems together. Electronic dampers, your steering angle sensors are tied into what the differentials are due or not due. Torque vectoring by brake and the open front differential and the torque vectoring mechanical differential in the back. All these things are talking together instantaneously now, which makes the driving experience more, more seamless versus cars in the past where there might have been a little disconnect or delay between all of these. Yes. So the all-wheel drive system in this car, and this is one of the biggest steps forward over the prior generation Golf V7.5, is it is now a torque vectoring rear diff. So the front differential is what they call XDS. So it's essentially a open differential with brake, with torque vectoring by brake in the front. The rear is a true clutch-based torque vectoring system in the back. So it'll send up to 50% of the power when it detects slip to the rear of the car. And then of that 50%, 100% of it can be sent either to the left or to the right. So it'll allow this car to both maintain grip better, but more importantly, it will allow you to get the nose in of the car faster. And of course, they've also changed the suspension geometry to accommodate that so there's more front camber in this vehicle. More negative front camber, yes. which also helps in a front wheel drive platform to hunker down, to give you the grip. Uh, you lose camber traditionally on strut front, so giving you more negative camber right outside of the box alleviates some of the weird pushiness and understeer that the last car would have had. It felt very front wheel drive and tight stuff, but when you were out in an open area, it was flying. So this is trying to find a better balance overall 360. Yes, so the last car was a Haldex, which could not torque vector in the rear. Basically, you would send 50% 50, 50 of the power in the back, and that's all it could do. It could not split that power left and right in the rear, where this car can. The drivetrains in this car, Mark, you have two gearbox options. Only in North America can you get a manual, and it is a direct carryover from the prior generation car. Or you can get a dual clutch, which has been altered for the added power of this engine. You only get a DI motor globally now for this car. It's still an EA888, makes a little bit over 310 horsepower, like 315. And the torque numbers or the torque output of this engine changes based if you have a manual or the automatic. The auto gets more torque, where the manual, probably due to the clutch or the clutch weakness. The carryover yeah, of the last generation car. Does not get the additional torque. Okay. So none of that's going to matter, Jack, when I put a stage four tune on here and just blow this entire thing up. Well, good thing you have some real brakes now, Mark. Oh, tell me about the brakes, Jack. So they are a two-piece brake by an unnamed brake manufacturer. You mean a two-piece rotor. Sorry. A two-piece <laughs> two rotor that you can't remove the hat from, so it's still a one-piece if you go to buy it. But it has an aluminum hat Yes. for heat dissipation, cooling. And has dropped some more weight, Mark. Ooh. Yep. But now it's time for us to go flat out on some farm roads on snow tires. Oh boy, that's going to be fun. Snow tires, Mark, on a Golf R. Wow, I can't wait to see how this bad boy does. I've spent 30 minutes turning off traction control, getting all the modes right, swapping through all the various screens. You should just screens. write a PowerShell script, dude. Have it all automated for you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Feel that diff, Mark. Ooh, feel the snow tires. Oh, there we go. This car is no joke, man. It's fast. Yeah, what they've, what the, they've done with the engine is really impressive, Mark. And the tuning is really good, too, here. It's not like what we see on our typical Subaru, WRX, and STI turbo cars. This is really well done. As a street car, man, the fact that uh, we didn't talk about this in the shop, but they went with a larger turbo for this EA888. This is about as fast as you could possibly use on the street. Oh, yeah, this, this is hauling ass. It really is hauling ass. And it pulls right up to Redline. There's no drama. We have everything off, and it's 
there's no floor. hesitation, there's no timing being pulled. It's just basically the, the second you launch it all the way to that fuel cutoff, it's it's pulling hard, hard, hard all the way up. Yeah, this is this is a really, really impressive car. I think the fact that they moved to a DVD has really elevated what the Gulf R is. It does feel a little bit more lively. I do not like the way drift mode feels in this car, and we talked about this off camera. Yeah, so it, it's hard because we're dealing with a loss of grip and with so much compliance and roll in these tires that what you get is this rollover effect of the tires and then the differential responds in the back. So there's this delay that we're getting that you normally wouldn't get with a summer tire, but it also exaggerates the car's natural tendencies. So when we're driving and you get in tight stuff, much like the last Golf R, it still wants to understeer before that rear end kicks in. The difference on here- On snow tires. On snow tires. The difference is the way that the power gets transferred now, it gets itself out of it much quicker. It will rotate quicker out and it maintains that plow state. It doesn't maintain it as long as it did with the old car. So it feels more nimble in the tight stuff, but you still have to work with it as it is a front wheel drive platform that 100% of that power is never going to go to the rear, it, it will never feel like a rear wheel drive car, even in drift mode. And drift mode, Jack. It's weird when you use it, Mark. What it does is it sends, it biases the power in the rear. And it doesn't feel like a, doesn't feel like a rear drive car at all, and I admit it's not, but you know, traditionally when you want a car to do a big power oversteer moment, like when we do on camera all the time, I get the weight to transfer to the front of the vehicle, I unload the rear, I give it some steering input, and then I ease into the gas. And the car will naturally want to do a big power over Yeah, it's going to lock the diff in the back and you're going to go sideways. Where this, when you turn on drift mode, the best way to test it to see what it's really doing, turn on drift mode, you turn off stability control, and it, it looks at steering wheel angle sensor to start to send power to the left or the right. So if you start to do one of these left and right, the sensitivity of what it's doing with the rear diff, you can feel the car t like twitching to the to the right or to the left when you just move the wheel a little bit and the car feels like- It's not organic at all. It's not organic. It feels like you have you know five degrees of toe in on the back. That's how much instability there is in the rear end to get the car to, to do the drifty stuff. But it still very much reminds me of the Focus R us the way that the drift mode is set up there so it's not something it's more of a gimmick i'll be honest it's not something you're going to operate on the street but the fact that they have all this electronic control of the differential makes it again a much more lively experience but it's also not as analog feeling it it feels like there is a lot going on in the background with this car yeah it, it does to be fair to this car though mark i do want to drive it on the track and we're yes. going to in spring so i can't really speak to the limit handling you know, in a track environment or, you know, with more it's gonna accurate be fueling good. tires. It's yes. going to be good. You can tell it's good here on roly-poly tires, and maybe a lot of people will buy this and put all season the snows on. I think what the biggest competitor is the Type R of this, and maybe at, to some extent the Veloster end, but the Type R definitely. The Type R has a better front end. It's got a better suspension layout in the front end, but where that the Type R can't make up once the tires run out is you don't have all-wheel drive, and this is going to be the biggest selling point to people that live This in. is going to be faster and corner exit yes. than the Type R, and I think it's a street car. I, I, th I think if you ran them back to back, kind of stock on the same tires, this would be faster because of the engine tuning, and I just, I get a sense that the back end is going to help you like you mentioned. Let's I, talk about maybe, we beat the, I beat that to death, input points and everything. Pedal so box. As a street car, and this is what I was trying to get at, the steering is perfect. It's very, very direct for you know an EPS rack. Pedal box, if you have bigger feet like I do, easy to heel toe. The shifter feels like a cable, cable operating unit, but it's still pretty decent. And on longer journeys, on the highway, it is a quieter car than the last car, even with snow tires. I think it's compliant enough for what this is trying to strike yeah. between being a fun weekend car and a good daily driver. Personally, I think this car, other than this, the infotainment and the interior stuff, is what the TLX Type S should have been when it comes to feeling alive. You have a good gearbox, you have an engine that actually has character, and because it's a hatch, it's a very usable car. It's still car. a hot hatch, yes. but a refined hot hatch. So this is, again, you, you're going into this expecting, like you said, TLX Type S. TLX Type S is more of a luxury car. That's that's more soft. This is still a little bit rougher for somebody that wants that driving engagement. But I will counter, I don't agree with you on the gearbox. The shift knob is a giant hunk of plastic. 
it feels like just a giant cheap cable assembly there is no connectedness to the gearbox it just feels like a toy the the pedal box to me does favor bigger feet so if you yeah. got big feet great but i have a difficult time i have to move the seat back to get a full heel toe so i mean there's little things that are gonna bother you depending yeah. on who you are and what car you came out of if all you came out of is german cars like bmws or vws the manual is going to feel great but if you're coming out of cars with a better mechanical like the type linkage, r has a better gearbox yeah it this. does for sure so, or even even the velociron has a better linkage and shift knob than this I, though i think i am excited for us to drive this in the future mark so with that it's time for us to head into the final thoughts all right jack sounds good Final thoughts on the Mark 8 Golf R. This is a flawed car. It is a brilliant vehicle to drive, though. And at $43,650, oh, I thank you, or $44,400 fully loaded, it's actually a bargain, and I can't believe I'm saying that. Cars have gotten so expensive that buying a vehicle that is this capable for this amount of money is actually pretty difficult this day and age. And the fact that at least North America gets a real manual transmission is something to celebrate. The driving dynamics of this vehicle are also something that are rather interesting. It is an extraordinarily capable car, but even when you turn everything off, you do feel some intervention at all times. It's not from the stability control system, but don't forget, this is a car with torque vectoring and the XDS system, which is torque vectoring by brake in the front of the vehicle. So it's always there to at least save you in conditions that you would otherwise probably crash a less capable automobile. The interior space, however, is the part that is a little bit disappointing to say the least. It is not a bad space to be in. The seats are comfortable, it's very usable, but the infotainment system is still very frustrating. It's not enough to break the car for me. I do think this is a very enjoyable vehicle to own. It's just it's something that I have to bring up, and hopefully it's something that VW changes in the future. This is one of my favorite cars I've driven for 2021, at least purely from a dynamics perspective. So I'm looking forward to what they do with this in the future. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon.